happens only before voiceless consonant, and she's very clearly a house-like speaker. And she very cleverly took this woman's house, synthesized it so that it uh, sounded like house, a little lower, and even sounded like house, very low. The sort of elocution teacher pronunciation of house. This is what you're taught to say. I mean, if you're a house speaker like me uh, from Kentucky, then they, then they send you to How Now Brown Cow School, right? Because every American right, knows the phrase How Now Brown Cow, and that's to cure your How Now Brown Cow call, right? Uh, here's what Nancy did. Nancy, uh, let's not pay any attention to the acoustic nonsense. We'll just look at the labels. Here's what the woman actually did, house. Here was a synthesized version of her pronunciation of something like house and then a synthesized version of which she called ultra-low of something like house. This is what you're supposed to say in quotation marks. Then Nancy was really sneaky. Nancy asked people, I think this is a ploy of being something like a person from Panasonic or someplace uh, studying voices for voice simulation on phone calls and this kind of nonsense, uh, and tricked these poor Michiganders said to them, I'm going to play you a voice, and then I'm going to play you three other voices, and I simply want you to match the first one to the second one, which sounds most like it. So remember, the voice she played is the actual voice, the host voice. When the top of the page suggested that the speaker was a Canadian, 60% of the persons who heard house said that it matched house. When the top of the page said that the person was from Michigan, only 11% of the people heard house and said that it sounded like house. Their ears are so infected with the incredible Midwestern idea that they are correct, that they quite literally cannot hear actual phonetic performances. House is correct, or even house is really correct, and so 51 plus 38% of the people heard a vowel that was nowhere near the actual performance that they were asked to match. Uh, I think, Nancy, with the synthetic work and then presentation to speakers uh, has shown, I think, in some ways more elaborately than any of the other folk linguistic work, uh, how your brain just gets in front of your ear. So if you go around saying, I have heard somebody say something, the first thing you want to do is say, well, I think I heard somebody say something. Because I don't think so. I think what you heard somebody say was that stuff that passed through the sociocultural filter. You were at the bottom of this folk linguistic triangle. Their beliefs and stereotypes <coughs> underneath this folk linguistic stuff, and I believe that they're very, very powerful. They are so powerful that they can even make you hear words which don't exist. Here is a Michigander who discovers the Kentucky word var. Our painters on the side are all southern guys, and one guy's from uh, Kentucky. You know, I was talking to him the other day, and he's so bad. He's so bad. He means the way he talks, of course, right? It's like, yeah, I went over var. Now, this Michigander, he's imitating a southern accent, and he says that the guy says over var. The other Michigander says, you feel like says he's going over var? Over var. We go over var. I was drinking that moonshine. Of course, now he's just playing with ordinary stereotypes. Where did he discover this word var? There isn't any word var in Kentucky. Regular phonological processes, of course, first produce over var because of the historical alteration between a eh and a ah ever since late Middle English times. Otherwise, you wouldn't have person and parson. You wouldn't have uh, it's more uh, vermin and varmint, right? Uh, so you got a whole bunch of pairs in modern language, which is the result of the regular alteration with uh, a and a uh, before r. So, no wonder Daniel Boone killed a bar, right? And no wonder lots of Kentuckians say the. But if you speak very quickly, it's very obvious that in many dialects, unstressed syllables can get deleted. So if you've got over the r, the er is real light. So what's the best thing in life to do away with light on important things? Delete them, right? So then you get over. Ah, but the transition to the is no good, so up jumps regressive assimilation. You, you can go to the bar later and talk about that. Uh, and up jumps <laughs> regressive assimilation and changes that uh, changes things into ovar, right? So that this this thar business uh, 
that this VAR business is not a word VAR at all, simply a result of regular phonological processes, but somehow hidden from the minds of Michiganders, because unlike about themselves, where they are ready to believe nonsense, namely that a host speaker actually said house, they're ready to believe anything about Kentucky speakers, namely that they invent silly words like VAR. <laughs> I wanted to tell you a lot more about the northern city shift and how really fouled up Michigan vowels are, but I'm not going to have time to do it. But I just want to show you a typical northern city's vowel chart. If you think back to my vowel chart, do you remember that I had an A right here? So when I say that the northern city shift is the greatest thing to happen to American English since the great vowel shift, I'm not exaggerating. These are people who really do say bien and panda and can. These really are people who say hat. These are really people who say caught for caught. These are really people who say things like bag for B-E-G, not B-A-G. So this is a massive vowel rotation. Um, I can't resist. I gotta play, uh, I gotta play at least a second of, uh, of this nice northern city shift stuff for you. Here's a young woman in the suburbs of Detroit. Uh, Nancy, we'll hey, here's my story about conflict. Um, the other day, I was sleeping at 3.30 in the morning. I was woken up by my roommate, who was talking on the phone with her boyfriend at the top of her lungs. So I asked her if she could go in the hall and talk, since it was 3.30 and I was sleeping. And um, she proceeded to talk louder. So I thought if I got out of bed and she realized that I was really awake. She got out of bed. She didn't get out of bed. Exactly. that maybe she could stop talking and go out in the hall. So I went and got a drink and came back, and I had to move the ladder to my side of the loft. That was her ladder, not her ladder, that she moved to the side of her loft, which is her loft. And when I did that, I disconnected the phone. So she got mad at me and told me I was rude. But we're hanging up on her and her boyfriend. That was hanging up on her, not hanging up on her. <laughs> so she called him back and said, I'm sorry, I was rudely disconnected from you. So she talked the love she could, top her lungs. So I left. That's my favorite one, of course. So I left. Why would you laugh? Of course, you didn't laugh at all, right? Here's her left down here. Jeez, there was no laughing involved here. She left. So this is a very dramatic example of what's going on here. So the, inter the interesting thing here, of course, is that these guys who are doing this shift, which is one of the most dramatic regular vowel rotations uh, since the great vowel shift of, uh, of modern English, have, as you can imagine, no local awareness of this shift. All you have to do is just drive into any large northern uh, Midwestern city, and this is one of the most striking things ever to hit your ear, or at least this young woman is very striking to my ear. Uh, maybe some of you have acclimated yourselves to voices like this over the years. To me, it's an incredibly striking thing, uh, it's producing words, in fact, like laugh that I can't even understand. Uh, and yet, I think the, the great truth of folk linguistics is that since Michiganders are so focused on their correctness that they don't even hear it. As you see, I had about uh, five or six more hours. Uh, <laughs> but I want to end with, uh, I think, some, some profound theoretical comments. Otherwise, you'll say, what do we bring this guy here for? <laughs> Real people are really different <coughs> from linguists. Not just a little bit. They really believe very different things about language, about the nature of language itself. And I've never found one quite so interestingly revealing is this conversation, and again it's with the same, uh, the same famous age, a Taiwanese food worker of mine, because again, he can ask a really interesting question. Because if a Navy speaker said, uh, what's the difference between a gift and a present? He said, oh, you know. But this guy, since a Chinese person has asked, he says, well, a gift is something like you, you go to a Tupperware party. Now this is really accommodating to a foreigner, right? So not a Tupperware party. <laughs> you a gift. I think it's more impersonal. Now look at this. This guy's working like a lexicographer, like a real lexicographer, right? How can you tell the difference between two close words? Well, you begin to go to situations and domains of use and figure out what those precise little differences are. Uh-huh. Uh, no, there's no difference, up jumps uh, Dee's wife. No, there's really, yeah, there's really no difference. And there is no difference. She wants to make sure that he knows that. That's true. And now comes the kicker. And this is what makes every linguist faint. That's true. There's no difference. Maybe the way we use it is, though. <laughs> How is it that what you can do is not real? 
you've got to have a very, very interesting theory of language if what people do with language is not what the language really is. And I think this allows us to construct something that looks like this. Here's what linguists believe about language. There are a bunch of individual brains which are loaded with language things called idiolects. Those idiolects are pretty similar for one reason or another, and we can group them together in what we might call dialects. And then usually, more for socio-political reasons than actual linguistic reasons, we can group some of those dialects together uh, and say that there are incredible fictions like languages. Languages for linguists are not real. The only things that are real for linguists are these neurocognitive realities called idiolects. On top of that, there are a bunch of socio-political constructions and some plain linguistic things like mutual intelligibility, which allow us to say that there are dialects. But then, of course, things which get called languages, well, all the languages in China are called Chinese. But the languages in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden are called three different languages. Now, that's just about the silliest thing you can imagine. There are an incredible number of mutually unintelligible languages in China, all called Chinese, and Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish are all the same language by Chinese standards. So it's only socio-political boundaries which do this. So these things for linguists don't exist. One of the things that you can go, you may not remember anything else tonight, but you can say that Preston said there's no such thing as English, Spanish, German, French, and I mean that. I mean that quite literally. So English, French, German, Spanish, Chinese are socio-political constructions of people with relatively similar cognitively embedded things, which then for socio-political reasons get grouped together. So languages don't exist. <laughs> Real people can't put up with that. That's just too unenabling. So languages the language exists as platonic realities for real people. That is, they have an extra cognitive existence. English is not here. English is out there. And it feeds your brain in a very mysterious, almost spiritual way. And if you open up your brain to language, I know this is sounding a little religious, but I think this is close to the truth of, of folk linguistic theory, you will be a speaker of good language. <clears throat> now, if you don't want to mess around with it too much and you want to be a kind of regular guy like us Iowans and Michiganders are, you don't want to go around doing good language. That's that British English out in New England and places <laughs> like this. So you can just do ordinary language. Now, it's language which admittedly has got a dotted line between it and the language. But you could, in fact, fall into incredible error and be a speaker of either a dialect or just make language errors. These are simply cases where you haven't opened your brain up to the delivery of this platonic, and I mean literally in good platonic theory, thing which exists extra cognitively and delivers itself to people who pay attention. There's another lecture which follows this, but how, if that wasn't true, how could people say things like this? This is a guy, a European-American Michigander, who teaches at an African-American school in Inkster. The children themselves, all of us at time, may say the improper endings. We may say it, but we recognize it. If somebody says to us, is it correct? You say, no. You know, this is the correct way to speak. Now, this means that people who don't know the way to speak that he imagines is the correct way have access to it. That if they would just sort of stop living a life of linguistic sin, <laughs> this platonic good language would somehow just enter their brains. And the rest of the rest of this lecture, of course, then, which can't happen tonight, was one that, that you could imagine, is one which focuses on things like the failure for Americans to provide language instruction in standard language if they want people to speak a standard language. You don't need instruction in what all you have to do is just open up and receive the truth. The truth will just fall into your brain. And they know the correct way to speak. And we have lots and lots of data, and a lot of this data is in folk linguistics, about the recalcitrance of African Americans who refuse to speak standard English. Not who don't speak standard English, but who refuse to speak standard English. This is sort of like somebody attacking me on the stage and saying, Professor, why are you refusing to speak Irish tonight? You know that we wanted to hear this lecture in Irish. I don't speak Irish. And 
good lord, even if I stood here with a shillelagh uh, and a bottle, Irish wouldn't come into my brain. I gotta do more work than that. Hell, I could even get to fight and I still wouldn't learn Irish. So th there's just no way that I can attune myself to Irish and learn it. And yet somehow, notice that this folk theory of language, is a very interesting theory on its own ethnographic and anthropological grounds, leads us to some debilitating applied linguistic behavior. Namely, the assumption that since language is this platonic abstraction, you don't have to work to get it. <clears throat> of course, this means that we can end up concluding, uh, as we have, that there are some people who have got this straight pipe laid out for them a little better than others. Uh, an accident of birth will do it. And so when H again asks old G, uh, where this standard language is, he says, well, if there is a thing called standard English other than textbook English, other than good English, <laughs> ordinary stuff, the kind of stuff that a reasonable person would speak, it would be the language that you're hearing right now <laughs> as you listen to the Midwest. <laughs> so I apologize for you for showing the green and white of Michigan State when I started this lecture. And uh, there it is. I think this is the, uh, this is the cardinal and the gold, uh, or at least the closest I could get to it in the, uh, in the colors that I had. And uh, although uh, we, we fool around sometimes with folk linguistics because we, we construct things which from a linguistic point of view or even from a more universal point of view make us think that we are kind of making fun of real people who lack access to the truth. This is not the right way for linguists to proceed. Uh, linguists, I think, need to know what non-linguists believe about language and what those beliefs are rooted in. And when we find this platonic thing, then we're, we're up against a real challenge. But we're up against a challenge which we need not only to address in our own research in a sort of, I think, responsible anthropological way, this is what a lot of people believe about language, but also if we want to serve communities in any kind of applied linguistics way, because to simply appear in a community with the truth, when in fact there is another lurking, deeply held pre set of presuppositions, uh, won't get us very far. So let me congratulate you for your good English. Uh, you do share it with Michigan, but I leave you, I think, with this little teaser that not all of us who believe uh, in good English may be doing what one might want to call the right thing. Thank you very much. speaking Spanish uh, in 50 years or 100 years. Some of us apparently devoutly fear 
So these things, I think, can be connected to these folk theories. Uh, but, but the biggest problem, I think, is the one you bring up at first, of course, that the, the people who believe in English only, I think, very clearly share this folk theory of language. They haven't really thought about what it is to, to ask for English only because they, they share the folk presupposition that, that it's out there and you, you put your finger on it, just like Plato did touch the tree. Well, the interesting thing about public education and grading on correct or, or incorrect English is a very interesting one because I think it's the folk theory which allows us to do that in ways which are completely irresponsible. If you brought people into algebra class and gave them their final grade in algebra on the first day before you taught them anything, everybody would say, you're not a very good algebra teacher. But if you brought people into history class and taught them a lot of history and failed them because the history questions weren't answered in standard English, I don't think you're a very good history teacher either. Unless you taught people, unless, unless you had some vehicle in that school which said, okay, little by little, we're going to teach people the kind of English which we demand from this in the school setting. But we don't do that in America. And look at places like Switzerland. People in north of Switzerland grow up speaking Schweizerdeutsch, or Swiss German, you know, at home. They run off to school, and somebody tells them, well, the Swiss German is really swell stuff. That, you know, that's what you speak, you know, as you wander around with your parents and your friends and so forth. But now, you're going to live in a kind of bigger world, and so we're going to teach you something like high German. You're going to read it and write it and so forth. And nobody ever says, in fact, they would kick him out of Switzerland right away, that, of course, we don't want you speaking that Swiss German anymore. It's just a horrible idea to most Europeans. And at the same time, while they teach them that high German, they don't punish them for using the linguistic schools that they came to school with. They, little by little, demand high German from them, but they provide them with a program of high German instruction. We assume, because apparently we believe in this myth, that people will somehow, what's the verb for osmos, osmosify, uh, <laughs> gather it in, yeah? That if you just open up your brain, that this, this stuff, this cognitively external stuff, is going to affect you. And notice how we talk about people who don't. People who don't achieve standard English are not just lazy people, they're just people who, who don't even care, who don't even pay attention as if the acquisition of a completely different system was something that you could do automatically just by being sort of half awake half the day. The okay. interesting experiment, of course, would be, uh, <laughs> would be to take a group of students, uh, especially teacher trainees, I think, and say, okay, everything you do this week has got to be in a variety of African-American English, which I've got a very good grammatical description of. I'm not going to show you that grammatical description, but everything you write and everything you say has got to be that way, or I'm not going to pay attention to what you say, and I'm certainly going to flunk every paper uh, which doesn't, for example, do negation uh, by, uh, by not only using multiple negation, that is, every indefinite noun phrase has to be negated, and if you want to speak the really standard variety of African-American English that I can speak, you also have to move all the auxiliary stuff to the front of sentences. So it's not, it's not nobody didn't come to no party. It's didn't nobody come to no party. And you'd have to speak that way consistently every day. Nobody could do that. Yeah, you can't speak African American English. You, you can probably do stuff like imitate African American English because uh, you watch the Sanford and Son or something like that. But you can't really speak African American English any more than a person raised in any other speech community can speak another dialect variety without considerable focus on it. Some people even claim that psycholinguistically it might be a tougher job to speak another dialect than to speak another language, to speak it consistently and well, and to, and to represent it authentically as a member of our speech. <coughs> so there, I think, is where, is where we fade in the schools. Yeah? We, we make a demand, and yet we don't fulfill the demand by providing the kind of instruction that, that would, uh, if, if that's what we want to do. I'm probably a little more radical than that, because I think this instruction is a two-edged sword. I think at the same time that you teach people to use the voices and language that will be most effective to get done what they want to get done, that at the same time you should be teaching people that there are voices and ways of using language which are effective that they haven't recognized yet. So all the burden shouldn't come over here on those guys who aren't like me, so that they got to acquire this stuff to get in, get in line with me. Some of the burden's got to come on the other side and say, hey, there's some guys like me, and gosh, you know, those dang hillbillies don't sound so bad after all. Now, I promise if you ask another question, I'm going to get a little answer. Just get a little answer. Am I done in? Is that it? We're done. Okay, thanks. Thank you.